All right. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today. My name is Nicole Lamberson. I was trained as a physician assistant, and I volunteer doing outreach for the film Medicating Normal, and I host conversations like this one today. Our guest today is Matt Samet. Matt is a freelance writer and editor based with his family in Boulder, Colorado. A survivor of psychiatry, he's the author of the memoir Death Grip, which was published in 2013 and details his fight to reclaim his life, health, and passion for rock climbing in the wake of iatrogenic damage. Matt is also a subject in the new award-winning documentary called As Prescribed. So, hey, Matt, thanks so much for uh, joining us today for this discussion. Oh, yeah, my pleasure. Good to see you, Nicole. Yeah, you too. So I guess to start out, like for anybody watching who isn't super familiar with your story, maybe you could give, you know, just a brief background. We're going to link a lot of your writings and videos that you've already done. So if people want to go watch, you know, the plethora of stuff that you've already put out with you know, tons of detail about your story and symptoms and stuff. They can they can do that too, but maybe just like a introduction. Sure. Um, you know, my my story's somewhat complicated, but basically in my early 20s, I was um, you know, I've always been very focused on rock climbing. And it's a a gravity sport. So you try to be light. And I had pretty, pretty disordered eating, which I think just sort of destabilized me, you know, and I'd have big bouts of depression and anxiety, started having panic attacks. Um, and when that happened, you know, it was when I was first introduced to benzos, I think as so many people are, you know, it's whether they're having anxiety or panic attacks or insomnia. Um, didn't take them that much, you know, sort of took them as needed, but, um, you know, they got their hooks in me. Um, had, you know, issues of of use and then eventually abuse with Valium later um you know sort of got through all that in my mid-20s you know still experiencing anxiety probably just because I hadn't sort of dealt with the underlying things causing it or I just hadn't accepted that there were other modalities for treating it other than psychiatry you know this was in the period of like the book listening to Prozac and all these new SSRIs had come out and you know, there's sort of, there were the quote unquote newer benzos, like the old ones like Valium and, and Librium had a bad reputation, but they'd come out with Xanax and Clonopin and Ativan, which they said were quote unquote safer, but actually aren't, um, mm -hmm. you know, or certainly more dependence fostering. But I ended up on a benzo every day from, I think, 1998 through 2005 um, and just saw my quality of life you know, this was uh, prescribed too. At that point, I was just using it as prescribed. Um, and I just saw my quality of life really deteriorate. Towards the end, uh, you know, I started to realize benzos are probably the root of my problem. You know, I was just having horrible anxiety and interdose anxiety and big panic attacks, gaining weight, um, you know, and as I tried to get off, I just couldn't really find the support I needed, you know, not from the doctor who's prescribing them, you know, not from um, psychologist I was seeing, you know, they sort of kept telling me my anxiety was terrible, not really looking at the fact that this was all um, kind of mediated by tapering too quickly and just by the damage the drugs had done. So I ended up, you know, poly drugged at the end, like I ended up um, at, at Johns Hopkins Institute and they knew that benzos were a problem because they seen so many people come through their doors who were having the same sort of stuff I was. But they didn't really acknowledge that benzos were the problem. So in order to get me off benzos, they put me on three or four other psych meds. I can't remember. Um, but as soon as I was discharged, I began tapering those. It took me about nine months to get off. So I haven't taken a psychiatric medication since October 2006. So 17, almost 17 years now. Um, wow. So I guess that's the ele elevator version of the story. Um, yeah. But Oh, sorry. I was just going to say like, what, t what tipped you off to knowing that maybe it's these drugs? Was there like research or did somebody else say something to you or just like an inner knowing? You know, I'd had a therapist who a few years before I tried to get off said, these are really nightmare drugs. You, you can't stay on them. And I think I was just in denial and I probably knew deep down how hard it was going to be for me to get off of them because I've been on them for so long. Um, that resonated. Honestly, I just began to 
I mean, what I was feeling was so potent and anomalous and so far outside my experience of any emotional state I'd ever felt that I was like, this can't be who I am. Like, this is not a normal human experience. Like, why, why would we feel this way? And I began to poke around on the internet, like kind of right as I was experiencing, you know, my sort of worst moments trying to to get off. And I remember there, there were some sites, I think it was benzoliberty.com. I don't even know if it's there anymore. Um, yeah, I don't think so. Like, or Benzo Island. That's an old, old one that yeah. old, old timers like me and you, we know about all the closed down ones. That's how long we've been around. Right? <laughs> that's, that's how long we've been in this business. Um, yeah. Yeah, I did find the Benzo Island too, I think, which was a forum. Um, but Benzo Liberty was all just testimonials from people who'd who'd been through it. I was like, well, these stories are exactly like what I'm going through. And so at that point, um, I found there was the Yahoo group. Um, you know, I think that Geraldine Burns had started, right, which was um, very important for, for getting the word out. And there was Benzo, um, is it Ray Nimmo's site in the, in the UK? It mm -hmm. might still be up. And it had the Ashton Manual, so I found that as well. Um, you know, unfortunately, I wasn't able to convince the psychiatrist I was seeing to, to taper me that way. But at that point, I, I started to have the information. And then I also met another survivor in person um, here in, in Boulder, Colorado, where I live, Allison Kelliger. And actually, her number for support group was up on the wall at the um, you know, Boulder Medical Center Hospital, where I ended up at one point because I, I didn't sleep for like a week because I, I got very, very sick from an antidepressant. Um, mm -hmm and called her and met with her in person after I had been discharged from Hopkins. So she was like, oh yeah, this is a hundred percent. And she's like, this is what I went through as well, shared her experience. And she was a huge, huge help to me um, as well. Yeah. So basically you were rapidly tapered or just cold turkeyed off of everything that you were taking. Yeah, I was. I mean, by the time I started tapering, I was on four milligrams of clonopin a day. And I think I was cutting you know, at first I was kind of going on my doctor's recommendation. I can't remember if I was cutting a quarter milligram every two weeks, maybe a half, you know, but it just obviously got harder and harder the closer I got down to zero. Mm -hmm. And that's when they were trying other drugs on me, which just, of course, made me very, very sick. But, you know, instead they were like, basically they're saying, you're the problem, you know, you're bipolar. That's why you're having these experiences or you're having a major depressive episode instead of looking at the fact that I was probably tapering too rapidly and just experiencing, you know, horrible, horrible repercussions to my brain and central nervous system as a result. Um, yeah. Yeah. That, that's sort of how it went. So then you decided at some point to write your story publicly. Um, I think the first time you did it was your beauty and the breakdown in outside magazine. Was that the first one? Yeah. Yeah, that's correct. I'd written a piece before that for Natural Solutions magazine, um, not about myself, but about Taryn Taylor, um, a woman in the in the Midwest who had gone through this as well and had had a horrible time of it. And, you know, she was um, kind enough and brave enough to share her story with me. So I'd written about the subject, but the piece in Outside was about my first person experience. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad you did that one, you know, and I tell it as part of my story all the time. That's how I discovered what was wrong with me was my dad had a subscription outside and he shared that story with me. And it was like what you said, just like reading the description of what another survivor wrote and the words that you used to describe what you were going through. It was just like undeniable to me, like somebody was speaking my language about what I was feeling inside of my body that I couldn't put words to. So um, um, thank you for writing that. Um, and then you wrote your book, Death Grip, too, after that. So I'm wondering, like, what made you say, I'm going to go public with my story, I'm going to write and, you know, put it all out there for people? Well, I just thought that the more knowledge that's out there about these things, the better. I, I just thought what I'd been through was so extreme that if I shared it and other people saw that and their own truth and it helped 
help them find a way through, it would be worth it. I mean, honestly, at that point, I had nothing to lose. Like when you've been through a bad psychiatric medication withdrawal, you're not that scared of, I think, the things that you might have been beforehand. You realize what actually sort of matters in life. You realize how fragile we are. You know, you realize that we're all in the same boat in terms of our fragility of our health. And and I honestly had just been so gaslit by psychiatry. I was I was angry, you know. I just felt like I need to tell my side of the story, even if it there's potential exposure risk. Um, you know, I just spent so many that final year trying to get off medications, you know, just being gaslit by them and polydrugged and not really being shown any sort of viable solution. And, you know, I could see that that wasn't going to change. So, you know, maybe the book would help sway some practitioners' minds as, as well and, and get them to start listening to their patients a little better and consider that, you know, people's subjective experience of this actually is very real. And, you know, even if it runs counter to what they learned in medical school, which probably isn't much anyway, they, they, they ought to start listening to people. Yeah, yeah. Were there any like positives or negatives about telling your story? I mean, did you get any feedback from people um, from the outside piece or the book? I mean, do you, did you hear from any doctors like that you were trying to reach uh, with your story? You know, it's hard to say, right? Because so much of it's anecdotal. I mean, mm -hmm. usually if people like something, they don't tell you or they don't comment online. If they don't like it, they'll... Yeah, you hear from them. <laughs> you hear from them. Yeah, I, I've stopped looking at reviews and stuff uh, years ago. So I'm I'm not sure. But anecdotally, you know, I've, I know lots of people in the climbing community and people who've reached out to me through LinkedIn or sort of the benzo community and have told me that, you know, reading it helped them. And some of them have included practitioners, you know, I have friends who are climbers who work in the medical field who, you know, paid more attention. I have friends whose children, you know, experienced distress in their adolescent years who they've seen pallid drugged and then have talked to me about what they, what they ought to do. I mean, obviously I don't have the answers at all, but I, I would just share my experience with them. So yeah, I, th I think it, it, it connected with people. Yeah. So more of telling your story, you uh, filmed as a subject in the new documentary as prescribed, and that film is in the festival phase, I think, of distribution right now. Um, if anybody is interested in seeing it or learning more about it, you can go to asprescribedfilm.com for more information, and we'll you know link everything below. But I'm just wondering, like, how was it? filming and ha has anybody around you seen the film and given you any feedback about it um yeah filming was great I mean it was a lot of fun to work with with Holly Hardman the filmmaker I mean she is, has been through this as well um mm -hmm. you know which is what piqued her interest in it she's a, a documentary filmmaker who had covered other subjects in the past so she obviously approached the subject with a lot of care and a lot of firsthand knowledge um and they filmed over a period of years too. Um, you know, I think it was 2015 to 2017 or something like that. You know, so when she was filming me, I was still, I had a, a bad setback in 2013. And then, you know, there were some underlying health issues that probably went with that that I didn't really address until 2015. So I wasn't actually that well during a lot of the filming, um, especially at first. And then slowly getting better as she filmed and, and some of that's captured in the in the film even though I'm only in there briefly but um I, I thought it was nice that she spent a lot of time filming with all the different people in the film so you can see how these things develop over the long term I mean obviously I think that's one big problem with this benzo stuff is that you know we present to our family or to caretakers or medical professionals in an acute crisis that often is best resolved through long-term solutions, you know, and so people try to put these band-aids on, they don't see us get better. And then like, like I did, you know, you get mislabeled or, mm. or poly drug, but if you look at how long it can take some people to heal and then follow them and then show that, you know, and conversely, if you show people getting worse, because they're being poly drugged or taking more and more benzos over the long term, I think it, it paints 
more of the story that needs to be told. And I think that's what's great about what what Holly did, you know, is just really putting the time into film over over years with all the different people who are, who are in the in the film. Yeah, I mean, you're right. It does take it's it's not a subject that you can just cover with one visit. Like we some of us go on for, you know, years and years and years and you really have to spend all that time with people to really capture the full story, don't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. So you mentioned the setback that you had and you've written a piece at Madden America about it. So we'll share that. But um, I'm wondering, um, do you feel like the setback, I think I heard you say one time it was as severe as the beginning and maybe even worse than, you know, like your acute phase of the first part of your withdrawal. And I'm wondering if you think it's because it was actually as severe or like you had been in it for so long that you were sort of off your coping game. Um, and I'm just asking that because recently in my own situation, I like agreed to do something that I haven't done in all the time that I was sick. And it caused me extreme distress. Like I was shocked at how unstable it made me in my withdrawal. And I, I was like, I haven't coped with like this level of suffering in so long because I've sort of put myself in this bubble and like made my world really conducive to chronic illness that I haven't like felt that, that horribly, horribly bad until I tried to step out of it and do something that I was like, oh shit, you know, it's not a setback, but it was like a flare up or something. So I'm just wondering in, in your setback case, like, was it the symptoms being so super severe, uh, or was it your coping or maybe both? I think it was both. No, I mean, thank you for sharing that you've been through that. Cause I think it's a good point. I mean, one, when I had my setback, it was 2013, you know, I went through my worst years in 2005 and 2006. So I had you know, it took me a good two, three years after, say around 2009, 2010, I was starting to feel like 70, 80% better. And by the time 2012 came around, I was like 90% better. So I, I just felt great. I mean, I was so grateful and happy to not be in that distress anymore, whether it was physical or mental or psychological or emotional you know and so when it hit again I think the one of the first things I felt was grief like yeah this is awful the, the worst thing in my life I've been through I now need to go through again and I could tell when it hit me that it wasn't just going to be like a one week thing I was like this is bad but also no the symptoms were stronger and more profound I mean they yeah they might have dovetailed with some health issues that I needed to treat that I hadn't been aware of but I also think they kind of caused them you know, no, it was worse. Like when it hit me, you know, it came on sort of slowly over a week, but then when it, it reached its crescendo, I just remember not sleeping and having these nightmares. And one nightmare, I had this nightmare that a witch had taken me and plugged me into the wall socket and my body was just coursing with electricity from the socket. And that was just my nervous system. It had just been completely um, triggered, you know, and, yeah. you know, it was such a, profound feeling within my body that my brain had taken it and turned it into this nightmare so no the the physical symptoms were worse too I mean I don't I don't know why you know I have no idea but they were bad. sorry my cat's freaking out behind that's me that's okay <laughs> that's good that's he needs right. the exercise whatever gets him moving yeah yeah and so people are going to want to know obviously how you know that setback was all those years ago um how how is it today um, I mean, it's been almost 10 years now. I'm, I'm a lot better. I don't think I'm as, as good as I was before it happened, but obviously I'm older, you know, a little less equipped for rapid healing. Um, but no, I, I, I lead a pretty full life right now. I mean, my main, my main symptom now, as it kind of always was, was trouble breathing. Like, mm -hmm. you know, my torso just kind of gets kind of rigid and I hyperventilate to some degree. Um, and I already had like a little bit of asthma, you know, muscle tension and stiffness. But, you know, there's a lot of things I can do now that I, I could not do early in this setback. You know, I'm, I'm able to work. 
I can be physically pretty active. You know, I do yoga, I take long walks, I, I rock climb as, as much as I want to. You know, for a while there, there was a real risk that if I pushed it too hard rock climbing, I could be very, very sick for days. Um, mm -hmm. Even in the heat of summer now, which is one of the triggers for me, I seem to do okay. You know, I, I reel back the activity level a little bit, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm basically fine, but it also takes a lot of self-care. I mean, yeah. there's not a day that goes by that I don't take a long walk or do yoga or, or climb or, you know, I think for me, a big, everyone's different for me. A big part of healing has always been moving my body to sort of break up the symptoms and the rigidity. So, um, yeah, I, I think I'm, I'm pretty well. It'd be nice to be able to breathe a little better. <laughs> Mm -hmm. But, you know, and I've had doctors say you have asthma and here, take this and I have like a little inhaler with me. But, you know, at this point, all, all of us, I think we've been through this are all sort of wary of, of doctors and things like that. So I um, yeah, just try to heal it myself. Being protracted, you know, myself and you were kind of like the stories that nobody wants to hear. We're the people who scare people, you know, mm -hmm. even when you say things like, you know, you're, you're, you live a full life and you're mostly better. I think because people want maybe to hold on to the hope that it like will completely go away, that there will be a hundred percent better. And, and then there's this, you know, fear, of course, when you're in the height of it, the most severe acute parts of permanence, you know, that word is thrown around in the communities all the time, mm -hmm. but I mean, what do you say to people who are afraid of that? Like, oh, but, you know, Matt still has like this or this left. I mean, does it get to a place though, where it's like good enough, where you can accept that and you're just happy to be alive and functioning and it's not on your mind 24 seven? Oh yeah. I've certainly reached that place. I mean, I don't think about it. I mean, at this point, it's been going on so long and, and you, you, I'm sure you're living this as well, that you don't really notice it. Like, I don't really have the old me to compare myself to anymore. And I think maybe that's what happens when people are acute. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're acute, you could still probably remember pretty good health or you were taking the benzos and every time you took them, you felt normal for a few hours until they wore off. You know, so you you have that benchmark. I mean, for me, it's been so long since I've had the the pre benzo benchmark that I don't remember. I mean, there's there's things I used to do that I miss. You know, I used to go trail running and I used to go up in the high mountains. Um, you know, but because I can't breathe well, those things are kind of off the menu for me. But again, I don't I don't grieve my old life at all. I mean, I think one thing that I've learned through all this, and I think one thing that you just learn as you get older, is that you're not guaranteed good health for your entire life. You're not guaranteed ease and peace you know like there are things that are much worse than benzo withdrawal you know chronic fatigue syndrome which does a lot of the same things we experience and might not ever get better i mean there's cancer there's you know having a terrible accident and then losing the, the use of your limbs i mean there's so many things that can go wrong that can change the trajectory of your life and and i i guess you know it's hard when you're acute to not focus on that and worry about permanence. And then as you get better, I think everyone naturally sort of evolves and has more acceptance, but it, it, you know, it just seems like, okay, even if you and I are quote unquote, the horror stories, I mean, look at us, we're right, sitting right here right now, having a normal conversation. Like no one's climbing the walls. No one's freaking out. We're both very far from the acute phase of withdrawal and we're both functional human beings, you know, albeit with limitations, but you know, again, I think that's, that's life, right? I mean, the miles accrue and Benzo's put hard, hard miles on the chassis, I guess. That's how I'd look at it. Yeah. I guess it's just kind of the acceptance process too, over time. Like as you're doing this, you kind of realize, but what choice do you have? You know, I remember very similar, something to what you just said in the beginning phases of this, when I was kicking and screaming and in the, like, I'm angry and this is unfair phase my dad said similar to me, like, nobody's guaranteed a good life. You know, it's like not, you, it's not guaranteed. And this is just part of what you're faced with, unfortunately, you know, and I hated him in the moment for saying <laughs> that I was so pissed, uh -huh. but as you get further, you know, into it and you accept and, and all of that rage kind of just dissipates because it's exhausting to be angry 24 seven, you kind of just move into that place of acceptance and it is what it is right 
Yeah. I mean, like you say, there's no choice. I mean, I do remember that early on. I would sit there and lament all the stuff I couldn't do anymore. And yeah, it's not fair. Why me? Why me? And then I realized the more I fight it, the worse the symptoms get anyway. So yeah, I may as well just accept it. You know? Yeah. So you wrote a lot from 2012 to 2015 for Madden America. Um, and I love all of your writings. If anybody listening hasn't read any of those, you should, and we'll link them. I think my two favorites are walking and lay down the burden of proof are my two favorites. So walking obviously helped you. Um, I wonder how much writing helped you. And then is there anything else you think that helped that you could share with people? In terms of those stories or just in terms of, um, I think just in general, you know, um, yoga, has helped me a lot. I know not everyone tolerates it and can really o- overstimulate people. Um, but yoga has helped me. Even when I was very, very sick in 2015 with the setback and other health issues, I I could do yin yoga and hold long poses on the floor and things like that. And it gave me, I mean, my days at that point were horrible. I was barely sleeping, but it gave me this sort of island. I'm like, if I can swim out to that island, of 45 minutes of gentle yoga. And for that time, I promised myself not to focus on symptoms and my body's going to feel a little better. You know, that helped me. Um, yeah, I think walking, just being outside, you know, which can be overwhelming when you're acute. I mean, I remember you had some, a really nice post. I think it was like, you'd gone out maybe to the, you were still really acute and you'd gone out maybe to the James river or something and and looked Mm. out and just, it was vast and overwhelming and way too much for your nervous system at that point. But yeah. And and I remember that feeling too, like I'd be out climbing and in the mountains and I'm like, God, they're so huge and they go on forever. And I'm just sitting here feeling fragile and sick and weak. You know, my senses are distorted. I'm having depersonalization, derealization, like this is intense, but over time that got better. But I think honestly, yeah, just being in the sun and breathing the air outside has has helped me a lot too. Um, diet, you know, for me, that means, you know, eating pretty clean and, and pretty vegan. Um, I mean, I've uh, honestly like avoiding toxic people. I mean, I know that's a, just a good rule of thumb in life, but a lot of the worst periods I've had are when I've had office jobs and had to deal with, you know, the, the bullshit that goes on there and, and people who really honestly probably have used my condition against me you know to um to sort of maneuver and position themselves so i where i you know i work for myself now or i work for clients as a freelance writer and editor and i think that that's been better you know i still feel mostly fine most of the time but if i'm having a bad day i don't have to answer anyone i can just lie down and 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 rest or take a nap so i think Yeah. yeah being able to to structure your life, but not have it so rigorously structured that when you're feeling poorly, you still have to show up because I think that really sets people off, right? It, um, it, yeah, it's very triggering. I think that was part of what caused me to have that recent thing is like committing to something that, you know, I, I'm used to just being in my own space and and only being sort of beholden to myself or maybe like interviews like this that you have to show up for at a certain time even though I cancel those too sometimes when I feel <laughs> horrible you know yeah. so yeah I get what you what you're saying um I read your movement of fear uh piece that you wrote for the as prescribed blog mm-hmm. and you talked about like whipper therapy where um you were exposing yourself sort of over and over again to falling to, um, you know, get rid of the fear response. And I was Mm -hmm. kind of torn, like thinking about it because I just wonder in, in benzo withdrawal or psychiatric drug withdrawal in general, sometimes there's this, this feeling, uh, amongst a lot of times like normal people who try to tell us like, you've got to try, you've got to push, you've got to put yourself in those situations. And there were so many times in withdrawal where like, it didn't matter how many times I exposed myself. It wasn't like, I guess, exposure therapy that somebody who had real fear 
I feel like w- it would have worked for them. Like they were legitimately afraid of something where my fears were just like chemical. And I knew I wasn't afraid of it, but it was like my body just, you know, physiologically made me afraid of it. Just reacted. Yeah. yeah. And so that type of fear, I felt like that exposure message, like frustrated the hell out of me because I felt totally out of control with exposure, not helping or working. But in other instances, I do feel like there's times where if I do something enough, like maybe I can reclaim a certain driving place where I can go there now because I've driven it enough that it's my nervous system is kind of immune to that, you know, taking that path. So, I mean, what do you think about that? Do you feel like there's sort of two extremes and withdrawal like exposure sometimes doesn't work and it sometimes does in the way that you described it in in that blog um no I think what you latched on to is that it really needs to be self-guided I mean I think that is what has worked for me the most and sounds like maybe it worked for you too when you have other people pushing you who haven't been through this and can't experience what you're feeling when you're acute and super reactive and they're like hey give it a try you never know yeah. that's yeah and and I got really fed up with that you know even with my own parents I just remember my my dad being like well why don't you go up in the mountains you used to really love it up there and I'm like don't you think if I loved it up there I would be up there right now if I could be and that's when he I think that's when he finally got it he's like oh Okay, yeah, it's like I'm not avoiding them. I, I just simply am not well enough to be up there. And I think it has to be self-guided and it has to be very slow and incremental. I mean, that that's that's what's worked for me, you know. And sometimes you will push too hard and you'll have a flare up and you'll pay for it. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I think that was a price I, I was willing to pay, but I don't know that that works for everyone. But uh, yeah, I felt like like you said, you've reclaimed these places where you're comfortable driving in, you know, that you wouldn't have dreamed of years ago. Maybe it's first, it's a four lane road and then it's the highway and then it's a road trip across the country, you know? Um, yeah. And I had to do those same things, but it, it was all, it's all been very incremental for sure. I never took big leaps and I, I would often get very angry with people who tried to push me to take big leaps until they backed off. Um, yeah. Have to, or when they like try to apply logic to something and it's like there's n- nothing logical about like a nervous system in fight or flight you know like why are you afraid of that there's nothing you know and it's like I can't I can't explain to you in words why I'm afraid of it it's just uh, physiologically uh, this is what my body is doing you know yeah, yeah it just yeah. freaks out yeah I mean the grocery store isn't necessarily a scary place per se why am I so scared of the grocery store I don't know yeah I just go in there and my, you know, my body just goes into, into hyperdrive, fight or flight mode. Yeah. Well, and I think there might be different people in this too, because I have in the 12 and some years that I sort of have to be it's like to try and push. And I've met people who literally just woke up or like over a period of a week, their withdrawal just sort of subsided and they were normal again like they weren't afraid of anything they were afraid of Mm -hmm. two weeks prior when they were in and so that's where you're like well then do you even have to try and you know (laughs) like those people just they were better and it was all gone so yeah it's just the spectrum I think yeah it is and I think that's what people need to realize you know it's really a spectrum and looking at people who've had protracted or horrible experiences and and worrying about us is sort of pointless because you don't know what's going to happen with your own story. I mean, all you can do really is gather the best resources, be as slow and careful as you can with your taper and, and, and see what the universe gives you. Yeah. So uh, I have a question about reintegration. I, I don't think people talk about it enough. Um, like getting back to life after withdrawal um, and especially like your relationships with people who were around you when you were sick, because I think people get into this mode of like knowing you as the sick person Mm -hmm. and then you sort of start to evolve or come out of it. So 
how was it for you? Like in your marriage with your parents, you know, your kids, like challenges, I guess, of reintegration. Um, no, that's a very good question. Um, very thoughtful. I, I didn't meet my wife until I'd already been through my first withdrawal and I told her immediately, you know, I was still in it. I told her what I was going through and she was, and how all this has been very supportive, but, you know, she saw me go through the setback. So she saw me get better and then she saw me get very much worse and then have to get better again. Um, you know, so that was certainly a challenge. I mean, it put a strain on any relationship. My kids, they've only, my firstborn son was born before I had the setback, but he was very young when I had the setback. My other kids, you know, were born post setback. Um, so they sort of only know me as they know me. I mean, they, you know, they're very young, so it's hard to explain these things in depth to them. But, you know, they, they know that basically the data has limitations, that there's some things I can do and can't do, um, you know, and I just make sure to do as many things with them as I can. My parents, you know, it's trickier, right? Because they've known me all my life. And I'm sure you've experienced this too. They knew me when I was well, then they knew me when I was really sick. And, you know, I came to them for a lot of help during that period too. And we were all trying to find solutions. Um, and I think they're, honestly, they're, I'm their only child. I think they're just happy and relieved that I'm as well as I am. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, a lot of my friends, you know, we're almost, you know, the bulk of my friends are, are rock climbers. You know, we share that together. So there's been times when I've had to disappear from climbing. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you form these really close bonds with people when you're climbing and they've all been there for me as well. Like all the people I climb with are people I would, spend time with anyway because they're high quality human beings so you know they've all been there for me and they've accepted you know like when I've had to come back to climbing obviously I've had months and years off of climbing at time and then had to come back and it's very slow to get back in shape and to get comfortable out there again and if you're dealing with a benzo damaged nervous system to get used to the heights and the exposure and the falling and uh, they've all been very patient with me. And some of them have even been through this stuff themselves. I mean, as you know, this stuff is way more common than than is often talked about. So I, I have some partners, climbing partners, who've also been through this. Um, and yeah, they've they've been very supportive. Yeah, I think, but like I said, you know, where it's trickier is where you interface with mainstream society. I mean, jobs, social mm -hmm. events, stuff like that. You know, my solution has been to withdraw withdraw but for me that's not hard because I don't really like being around people anyway so <laughs> right no, no big sacrifice yeah it's like this feeling kind of like you can't win because you want to go and do things but at the same time you don't want to go and do things and then you want to be invited but you also don't want to be invited like I've felt resentment for being invited and not invited so it's like mm -hmm. the people can't win either way you know it's like yeah but yeah it, I can just Im imagine you know fully getting back to life but it's good that you've had you know really great people it sounds like around you and empathetic folks in your corner yeah I think it's helped yeah I mean like you said I mean probably some of it too is people who love you but are just confused too like why does Nicole come sometimes and then not others? Mm. And they're trying to figure out too, because you, you just look like you, right? You look the same. It's not like you have a broken leg. We're like, I got to stay home. I have a broken leg. So Yeah. And you try to explain it, but no matter how many times you try, it's like, it doesn't seem to take or like most things with sickness, people expect something to be like short-lived and you just heal in this linear fashion, like from a cold or flu, or like you're so ill with cancer or something that you die. Mm -hmm. But we just kind of hover around in this middle thing. That's like for years and years and years and years, you just slowly are kind of sick and getting slightly better a little bit out of time. And people don't have a frame of reference for that. They don't understand you know no I don't I mean you know the pandemic's been horrible but one thing that emerged right is that long COVID and maybe people will start to understand more about chronic lingering and kind of inexplicable syndromes like this I mean right there's people that yeah. have had the virus that a couple of years later are still dealing with weird funky stuff maybe they'll have it for the rest of their life maybe they won't but perhaps this will help you know build more empathy as, as well yeah 
So I wanted to ask about your DPDR um, or depersonalization or derealization or dissociation for people who don't know what it is. I'm just curious, like when it started to go away for you, did you notice uh, it like suddenly went or was like a slow thing where you sort of started connecting back to reality again? You know, both times I've had to heal, I would have constellations of symptoms and they wouldn't always go together in the same combinations, but it would sort of be like, oh, this week I have bad derealization, bad tremor and sweats. Oh, next week I have insomnia, anxiety, and you know everything I, I smell smells horrible. Um, so I think what happened with that one, that one was one of the big ones that was definitely there for a while. And I, I still get like little spates of it, but not, not in the way that I do. Um, yeah, but I, I think it, it just kind of ebbed gradually over time. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think, like, how did I notice it going away? Let me explain something that I'm sort of experiencing. And I'm wondering if it like resonates where randomly out of nowhere, like you're in a dissociative state or I am pretty chronically, I, I've had it for most of my withdrawal. But randomly in the last handful of months or whatever, I'll start to like notice that I smell something way more. It's not a bad smell. It's like normal smells. And my brain sort of says like, I remember that's how that used to smell or the carpet under my feet, like feels a little more real than it felt before. Mm -hmm. like the wind in my hair I'll I'll notice it. Like if my brain could speak, it would say like, whoa, like that felt like the wind I used to remember sort of, but it's very like fleeting these moments. Right. So I'm wondering if like that sounds familiar to you. Yeah, I think it does. I mean, I think that's why I tried to get outside so much because I think you have so much sensory information coming your way. You know, when we're in a house, it's quiet and you know, it might not smell like much of anything and there's not much to look at other than the same stuff you've already seen. So you're, you're not that engaged, but I, I know that you know take i think that's why walking has been useful for me you're exposed to the air and to the smell of the the forest or the flowers or you know there's like a brewery near us and it kind of smells horrible when they're making beer but i smell it and it grounds me in a particular time and place um you know i think that's why climbing has been especially useful for me because it is a very grounding activity like there were plenty of times when i'd go climbing and i had bad dpdr and it didn't help that much but you know when you're climbing your hands are literally on the rock you have this direct contact with this medium and you have to hang on to the rock in order to make upward progress and it, it is very focusing so i think yeah i think those things help me and sort of like you i would just have moments where i felt connected again and the more I did those activities that brought connection, the longer and longer I could connect for each time. And yeah, kind of a thawing, like you described, you know, eventually you just get longer and longer where you're not kind of dissociating. Okay. So I guess we have, you know, a handful of minutes here at the end. And I'm just wondering, like, what have you learned from your withdrawal? Or if you could go back and like tell that guy long ago who was about to take psych meds something i hear people say all the time like oh i'm grateful for this experience so i'm wondering if you feel similar and that kind of thing um, <laughs> i mean i would just as soon have never been through it but it was very humbling mm -hmm. you know i i um i think it, it's very useful and in, in that it, it wakes you up to mortality um you know, whether you want to do that or not, you sort of have no choice but to, to face it because you'll see how frail you are in the face of this thing that is much more powerful than, than you when you're in a bad withdrawal state. Um, so I'm, I'm grateful for those lessons. It would be nice to have learned them in such a way that I don't have lingering symptoms years later. I think that I could do without, but yeah, if I could go back and, and, and tell the old me who was you know, it was very scary. Like when I first started having panic attacks, I mean, it's it's terrifying experience. And even if, yeah. even once you know what they are, you're still just you're really scared, you know? And I was always in this sort of anticipatory state, like worrying about more of them and, you know, just living this sort of weird 
cloistered life because of them. But I, I would go back and I'd tell myself, you're not, you don't want to hear this, but there are long-term solutions. They're going to take a lot of work and they might not cure things a hundred percent, but they're not going to make you sicker. And I think that's what I would, I would tell myself, you know, if I could go back and do it again, yeah, I would have never taken that benzo. It would have just been, you know, like, look, you need to do some yoga. You, you need to stop sort of pitying yourself. You need to get outside and be in the world more. And, uh, you know, you need to take better care of yourself consistently. Uh, I think that, yeah, yeah, that's what I told myself. When I would say too, like, it, there is no shortcut because the stuff that I should have done in the beginning that would have made it so I didn't take psych meds is all the stuff that I had to do times like a hundred to survive mm -hmm. coming off of psych meds. So like if I would have just done it in the first place, you know, but I also think like in our defense, there's no one's talking about that sort of when you're a kid and you're coming up through middle school and high school and you know, even college, there's no real like discussion, or at least in my life, I don't feel like there was about like, how important health is and how you get one body and you have to take care of it. And it sounds stupid, because I went to medical school, but I guess like, I didn't realize that your, you know, your health is so fragile, and you have to do all of these things to sort of take care of your yourself and your your, you know, mental health and eating right and all of these things. It was just like not on my radar at all as a 20 something year old, you know? Yeah, I think that's a good point. I mean, we're just conditioned to, you know, when you're a kid, you have a headache, you take Tylen children's Tylenol, you know, if you, if you break your arm, you go to the doctor. I mean, obviously you go to the doctor for broken arm, but yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, Honestly, is there is there even a job that someone who helps people in that way? I don't know, other than life coach, you know, are there people out there? I mean, there's lots of people you can go to that will help you address the things that need to be addressed. You can go to, a, you know, a nutritionist to help you eat in a way that promotes long-term health. You know, you can go to a, maybe a naturopath or, um, you know, a doctor who's who's wise about you know treating things holistically and not symptom by symptom but yeah I, I don't know I mean so much of it like you say is preventative I mean the things that you had to do to survive withdrawal would have been so much easier when you were in good health mm -hmm. but at that point there was no one there to tell you to do them and you know who is that one person who sort of shows you the way I, I don't really know yeah. yeah I don't know well I guess that's kind of the lesson you know like you have young kids you know, that's something you can do for your children at least. But then everybody I tell that to who I know that has kids say like the last person that kids want to hear something from is their mom and dad. Oh, yeah, they, <laughs> so, don't to, they don't listen to us at all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, right. It's, like what I have listened, you know? Yeah, yeah. You would have done the opposite, right? Cause it's coming from mom and dad. That's the problem. Yeah. I mean, maybe they'll get older and then start to realize that at least have a few things of value to say but yeah right now i can't even i can barely get them to pick their jackets up off the floor you know yeah much less consider a life plan that involves not um <laughs> not taking poor care of themselves yeah i hear you well i guess to close maybe a, a good last question is i mean i i feel like you know you've been around longer than me but looking around like i feel like the the needle has really moved since the early days, like when we first were around, there was like one YouTube video. I remember it was like not much at all. And now I feel like we have stuff to share on medicating normal social media constantly. Um, as far as this topic goes and people being critical of psychiatry and withdrawal, you know, support and information. Um, so I guess, you know, there's some hope, but really, you know, the people, I guess, who need hope the most are the ones who are like in the early stages or in the thick of withdrawal. So what message would you have for them? Um, what would you like them to hear? My message would be to hang on no matter what, I think. I think that's the tragedy of all this, right? Is it 
folks like you and I have been around a while. I've seen people take their own lives because of this. Um, and it yeah. really is temporary. I mean, you might get 100% better. They might have been one month away from being 100% better. Uh, yeah, I, to just say, don't honestly, just don't kill yourself. I think that's yeah. the big one. Like, if you've endured it so far, it's probably not going to get any worse. So you've you've shown that you have the strength to endure it. So just keep enduring. I mean, it sucks. It's it's horrible. You know, white knuckling is is horrendous, and the symptoms can be, you know, completely horrific and, and life altering. But I I do know that both times I've been through this, I have come out on the other side, and both times I've come out to a life that that I love and I'm grateful for. You know even with its limitations. So I would just tell people that, yeah, don't, don't check out. Yeah. That's my same spiel that I say, you know, people say, how did you do it? You know? And I just say, I honestly don't know. It's just stringing enough minutes together until they add up to something, you know, and I, you're buying I time for your body to heal, right? Yes. That's Distraction, you know, just you've got to just get through enough days to where you outlive it. Like that's it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think that's all it is. Yeah. Distraction, whatever mindless thing gets your mind off the symptoms, you know? Yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to let you go. Cause I know you have something, a uh, family event and you're also not feeling well. Um, any last closing thoughts for anybody before we go? Oh, here, Hammy. My last thought is Hammy wants to say hi. Here's uh, Hammy. Hi. Hammy's, he's a little unhappy with me right now because he's on a diet, but we're, we need to get Hammy back in, in fighting shape. Yeah. All <laughs> no right, more, Hammy. No, yeah. <laughs> well, thanks, Matt. It's always a pleasure chatting with you. And really, I say it all the time to you, but I'm so grateful that you put your story out there because it, it saved my life. And it's the reason why I come on and do things like this and continue to contribute to the community. Cause I think it's so important that we, you know, keep speaking up and letting people know that we're out here and um, you know, they're not alone. So. Oh yeah. No, of course, Nicole, it's always great to talk to you and thank you for the, all the work you do. Were there any questions from people that you wanted to pose to me or. Um, I don't see any that have come through. So okay. yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. Well, thanks everybody for watching this live discussion. If you have not seen Medicating Normal, you can go to medicatingnormal.com slash watch. If you want to know more about As Prescribed, where Matt is a subject in that film, you can go to asprescribedfilm.com. And if you want to support the film's outreach efforts with a donation, you can do so at medicatingnormal.com slash donate. Thanks, Matt, again, and everybody else for tuning in, and we'll talk soon. Thanks, Bye. Nicole. All See right, you. take care. You too.